All right, welcome everybody to the February 23rd Hyperledger Technical Oversight Committee call. Uh, as you are all aware, you've seen this before, the antitrust policy notice is something that we must abide by, as well as our code of conduct, which is linked in the agenda. So for announcements today, we have, uh, I think it was three announcements. Somebody would mind um, moving the screen, but the first one is the standard Dev Weekly developer newsletter goes out each Friday. If you do have something that you would like to include in that, uh, please leave a comment on the wiki page. Uh, the second one is, as you are all aware, last week we had Min come in and talk to us about the Hyperledger mentorship program. Um, there is the, the project proposals that are being requested by the community to be submitted by March 15th. If you have anything that you'd like to um, have a mentor for, please leave a project proposal there at the link. Uh, the third update here is last week we had talked about the project updates governance when we would merge P PRs that came in for the project updates. I did uh, submit a PR for that last week. It did get merged in. Um, I wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of that because I think there was only a couple of reviews before it did get merged in, but uh, that uh, change has gone into the TOC site so that you should be able to see that. Any other announcements that anybody would like to make? No, okay. Uh, so then for quarterly reports, we did get one quarterly report that came in, the Hyperledger Bevel one uh, first came in on the wiki, but then uh, has been uh, sent in through GitHub as a PR. There have been, I think, five or six of us who have had a chance to look at that as of this morning, um, morning my time. <laughs> so if you haven't had a chance, please do have a look at that. I did not see any comments in the PR yet, any questions, but does anybody have any questions or comments on the, the Hyperledger Bevel report at this point? I have a comment. Okay. Um, they aren't using date ranges on their thingy like you like, and I looked back at their previous reports and they haven't done it either, so I didn't say anything. I didn't change anything, um, but. Probably worth a comment then. Okay. We can do that. Yeah, I think it's, I think the, the interesting thing about the insights reports are that if you don't have a date range, it basically will be whenever the person clicks on it. So uh, for example, uh, if somebody had submitted something last year that just said the, the next, uh, the past 90 days, if I went and clicked on it today, I wouldn't see last year's 90 days, I would see this year's. Um, from the time that I clicked on it. So um, that's, I think, what uh, Rai is referring to here. Uh, Stephen, you have a question, comment? I think in in this ver in this version of Insights or this uh, screen, there is no way to do a fixed range. Or is it, are you just saying do the last three months as the range? No, um, what I'm saying is, so a lot of the other projects will do something like here, you know they will yeah. they will yeah. do so yeah and you can do a range there right right um the one that they're linking to you can't do a range though correct that's right on this page you can't do a range right okay and given that all the development effort has moved on to version two it took uh some uh arm twisting on my part to get uh anon creds and solang added to this list um, because they don't want to do anything on the old version. Uh, but yeah, that's, I don't think I can get that feature in. Can you get arm twisting to get them to do date ranges on version two? <laughs> I have already twisted those arms. I, so. uh, I assumed you would have, right? <laughs> All right, any other comments on the project reports? 
part you were going to say something you came off mute. Oh, I was just going to comment on the issues with requesting LFX features. Yun Rai does a great job and puts in a great effort on that. And, uh, you know, um, unfortunately, we may not see that as soon as we want. All right. Thanks for that, Hart. OK, so there's no other comments. We are expecting actually three different reports to come in, hopefully today. Um, they are due today, the grid transact in Solang reports are due today, and then Cello is due next week. So we will be on the lookout for those to come in as pull request. So for discussion items, I didn't have any specific uh, TOC discussion items. I do have on the list here to talk about the project best, best practices uh, task force. But does anybody have any discussion items that they would like to talk about EOC related before we get to the task force discussion? Such a quiet group this morning. Okay, so that's a no. Um, so Dave, I guess we are handing the floor to you. I know you've done some work already on uh, project best practices, but uh, Floor is yours. Okay, I will share my screen. Do you see it? We we do see it, yes. Okay, so this was an initial brainstorm um, for what we want to do around the project best practices. I've tried to define a short objective and expected output, and then I took my first stab at what I would what I had in my mind at least for what this um, project best practices would be. Uh, essentially, I'm thinking of it as uh, all-encompassing, um, but but rather shallow. And my target was really, I kind of had in mind a new project or a new maintainer that's coming on board and they don't know what to do. So I know when I became a maintainer, I really didn't know what I was doing. And I, it took me several years to even realize how much I didn't know that I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> And having something like this, where I could see at least the universe of expectations, um, guidelines, and best practices would have really helped me. Um, and so let's let's walk through the objective and the expected output first, and then we can go through, we won't get through the full list today, I'm sure, but we'll, we'll step through some of these, not sentence by sentence, but maybe section by section uh, as, as we review this and use this kind of as a working session. Um, we have not had a, a meeting within the task force yet. I thought we'd do an initial one here to kind of uh, get the ball rolling, make sure we're all on the same page in terms of objectives, expected output, and so on. And then maybe we can have some uh, smaller group meetings to make some more progress. But let's see how far we get today. Okay, so for the objective, uh, let's read this, it's pretty short. The project best practices task force intends to gather existing project guidelines and best practices in one central place and identify gaps that may be addressed in parallel or future task forces. And then the output I'll also read and then we'll pause for some feedback. The expected output is a centrally located concise reference document to make project maintainers and contributors aware of the universe of project related guidelines and best practices along with links to the various resources available to them for further learning and adoption. Follow on targeted task forces may be proposed. So does that make sense at a high level to everybody? So Dave, just a, a question from myself. Um, the, the intention is that we will publish this to the tlc.hyperledger.org, is that the intention? I guess that's the next sentence that I didn't read. <laughs> yes, eventually. So this uh, wiki page is for initial brainstorming and collaboration amongst us. Eventually, I, I think we'll um, publish a document kind of like this um, over to the toc.hyperledger.org, yeah. Okay, great. Park. And so Dave, thanks for putting this together. Uh, just to clarify, so what you want this to be is you want this to be like a document for maintainers uh, to learn about best practices, 
rather than a task force that is going to, you know, suggest new best practices for Hyperledger. Is that correct? Well, I think it's both. I think, yeah, the outcome should be something for maintainers to, to be able to see the, the best practices. But I think to get there, we have to go through uh, amongst ourselves and figure out what those best practices should be that we propose to maintainers. So we have, uh, we have a lot of things already. And so the first thing I wanted to do with this is just gather up those existing things. Oftentimes there's something like, you know, the, the common repository structure where I say, oh, I know we've talked about that in the TOC, but I can't remember where it is. So one thing I want to do is make this kind of a, an outline or an index of some of the existing content that we already have. Don't want to repeat anything. I want to mostly provide links to those things, but just have a all encompassing list where uh, people can see that like the universe of things that we've decided on. Uh, and, and some of these will be TBD. And maybe even when we publish this, maybe some of them will be TBDs. So I think that's fine. Yeah, that's great. Um, I just, uh, I think it's best if the, you know, if the task force scopes are, are kept in sort of bite size amounts. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the part about um, follow on task forces may be proposed. So yeah. I thought we would do like a, a one quick, one quick pass through kind of an overall scope. And then where we want to have deeper discussions or where there's not consensus yet, spawn off task forces for those. And some of, a lot of those exist already, to, to be honest. I don't think we need a lot of new ones. For example, I'll call out, we have a disclosure task force. We have a security artifact signing task force. We have documentation and onboarding task forces. So a lot of these task forces are already in place or have been proposed at least. We might need one or two more follow-on uh, task forces, but yeah, the intent is not to do, not to define every single best practice in the world in this task force, but to just kind of do a quick overview of what we have, what the gaps are, and what follow-on task forces might be required. Great, yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Um, I, you know, that that's great. It's relatively, you know, small in scope, and it has a useful output, and you know, you can take the deeper dives in future task forces. Right. Awesome. All right, Stephen. Um, one of the things that I was thinking of for for this would be um, to try to use the whole, the breadth of the community to find the best example of each thing. So where one project has focused and done a really good job on documentation, highlight there is an example and and get them to write up how they did it. Here's one that has a really good CI CD pipeline that produces, you know, multi-architecture container images. Here are the GitHub actions and things that they did and try to truly find that best practices um, across the projects and just see if we can um, get the projects to to share how they did, how they got to where they are. So I, I don't know if that's captured in this, but it would seem better than us trying to declare what the best practices are is to use the community to sort of crowdsource the best practices. Yes, uh, that makes a lot of sense. So I didn't make that explicit, but you know, there's some things here like the RFCs where I highlight a few examples or the contributing docs where I highlight a few examples. I think it would be good to, like you said, make figure out first it, take an inventory of what we have, and then figure out which of these do we want to highlight as a reference best practice. Um, you know, I, I don't really know how to do that with kind of the, the community crowdsourcing way. Um, we can put it out there and and see what, what suggestions there are, uh, or we can in this task force, we can kind of look at these things. Maybe we review each of the contributing docs that I have highlighted here and figure out which are the maybe two or three that we want to highlight instead of the six or seven that, that we've got. One of the one of the things I was thinking was sort of a survey across maintainers that sort of says, do you do this? Um, or how well do you does your project do this? And and list all the things and you know range from I've never heard of this to we're brilliant and and see where we get. I think that would kind of be interesting, especially if we could find, you know, just a link to to something. 
anyway. Yeah, I, th I think that's a good idea. Yeah, maybe we could um, put out a, a note saying, if you want to be considered as kind of a reference model, uh, let us know and and and, sh and show us uh, where you where you're keeping your your content. I think that's a good idea. So, any other comments on kind of the overall objective and output? Rama. So uh, the. Operating model is also in scope, right? Or is, or is, it, is it not? Like uh, how uh, maintenance should be, uh, how frequently maintenance should be meeting to connect and triage, um, how they should be managing, let's say, a sudden explosion of contributions. And these are all things which uh, people may, not, may or may not be prepared for, depending on how much experience they have with uh, like collaborative software development. Uh, yeah, I'm open for anything. Uh, that being said, a lot of things we kind of defer to the individual projects. But if there's things that we think would be helpful as guide, either guidance or best practice, uh, we can surely keep that in here. I think, uh, like, if uh, some of the lessons, uh, let's say, you've gained as uh, Fabric is one of the most mature hyperledger projects, that would be quite useful. Like, what lessons you learned along the way. And uh, I imagine Fabric operations have reached a somewhat quiescent state, right? I mean, you have a particular oper operating model which works for you, uh, given the uh, kind of maintenance you have, the, the ones that are at least regular. So I think that might uh, give other projects uh, a lesson. Yeah, uh, we do. Uh, that being said, I'm not sure everything we do is the best practice, to be honest. <laughs> um, sure. But yeah, I can certainly share. Thanks. Okay, if there's no other comments on objective and output, I think we'll start going through some of these sections. Um, the first few I think are pretty easy because they're just pointers to existing guidelines. Um, like I said, I, I wanted this to kind of be an outline and an index, even to existing content. So we have maintainers guidelines, we have a common repository structure, and we have inclusive naming guidelines, which I think are pretty, uh, pretty clear if you read each of those documents. Uh, I've at least highlighted what's in those so people see at a glance uh, what they can get if they if they drill into those documents. So I don't think we need to spend much time on this unless anybody has a comment here. So Dave, I think on the first one, the maintainers guidelines, I like the maintainer responsibilities. Uh, Stephen, you had just asked about that, right? Is there any place that documents good maintainer responsibilities? I think in that document we were pretty light on what that means right like you should include something in your documentation about this like how the how they deal with maintainer calls and quarterly reports and things like that right but we're not very specific in there it's a very short paragraph maybe one sentence <laughs> under the what does being a maintainer entail so i'm wondering like is there and, and maybe this is a you know a, out to a separate task force, but is there something that we should be doing to expand what is in here? Uh, that's a good point. I think some of the best content is actually in the actual example projects. Um, some of them do a better job of defining the roles and responsibility of a maintainer, and we could um, grok those and you know and bubble up some of the most most important line, most important guidelines and best practices and and put them in this section, for example. So if somebody wants to volunteer to do that uh, we could take names even at this point if somebody wants to i don't know if that's necessarily a, we need a full task force for something like that but we could definitely not a task force that's a pull request <laughs> steven did you just volunteer oh it sounds like it I'll see if I can get somebody. Um, we were planning on doing that on our team because somebody was looking for that in one of our projects. So I love volunteering. I do it a little bit. <laughs> much. I don't know. Yes, I, I don't mean to volunteer either, <laughs> but I, I had a question and I don't mean to, you know, if it's too much into the details of the weeds here, feel free to stop me and not ignore me. But, uh, you know, I always wonder, I mean, one of the things that I think, you know, I always consider as you become a maintainer, 
it becomes a high priority for you to review pull requests that are being submitted to the repo. And I even have claimed before that it becomes a higher priority than submitting new pull requests. Because my basis for this is, well, nobody else can. Other maintainers, of course, but that's it. So you become a bottleneck. And if you don't make it a priority to s s review and, and merge other people's pull requests, then you kind of become the blocker. And so I know this, you know, I've said this before publicly and I've had some pushbacks and, and I was wondering if, you know, people, what people thought about this. I absolutely agree, to be honest. I put that here as a comment. 100% agree. All right, I'm glad all those who agree, thanks. Okay. So if we agree, yeah. yeah. So if we agree, just to finish, I, I, you know, I think it's important to spell it out because I think people should understand that when they when they apply or they you know want to become a maintainer, that it's well understood that this should be an expectation. Thanks. Makes sense. Yeah, I think we could um, defer that to to Stephen's pull request, and we'll further mm -hmm. discuss that when the pull request comes in. But hopefully, that'll be highlighted there. Could someone pass a link to the um, page where that, to the repo, where in the repo that document's found? I don't even know where it is. I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Thank you. Steven. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, let's keep moving. So like I said, I want to kind of do a high, high level pass um, and then we could uh, for like for like like the one we just did, we could fi figure out a next action in terms of whether there's a pull request needed or maybe if it's large enough a task force. So the common repository structure, I think this is this one's in pretty decent shape. So I think just a link to it is good enough. Does anybody have any comments on this one? Do you want a make file or we leave that to the maintainer? Uh, we have attempted to enforce this through, uh, I forget what it was called, but some tool. Uh, and we decided not to enforce a tool at that point, rather just leave it as guidance. Okay, okay. Uh, in the inclusive naming one. So this isn't a, um, this isn't in our GitHub, it's actually, in our old wiki as a decision, a sort of set of decisions and recommendations. Uh, and this has been in our um, reports for a while now as, as questions to make sure each project has filled this one. So anybody else see anything needed for this one? Okay. Uh, uh, Peter, and then, Peter oh, hold on. Peter, Peter just raised his hand. Sorry, it was a last minute realization that uh, not to plug what I created, but we could also add the TCI and get of action there. Not necessarily a recommendation or a, a rule, but as a, an optional advice on how to easily. Uh, double check and keep double checking if there's uh, compliance with the inclusive name guidelines. Oh, wait, sorry. Could you hear anything that I just said? Uh, I heard it, but I, I didn't quite capture the beginning. Um, so yeah. is there a, what's the, what's the net, the net of sorry. that, please? I yeah. think I was speaking the wrong microphone. There's two of them here. So I was right. just saying that uh, as an optional recommendation, you could put down that if somebody wants to make it easier on themselves, they can use the DCI Lint GitHub action, which uh, they can just configure for the project out of the box. And then it checks on every pull request whether the source code is still up to the guidelines. So there's an existing GitHub action out there, you're saying? Yes. And what's it called? 
DCI-Lint. Like that? I can, uh, yeah, I can add the link to it with the, with the documentation on how to set it up. Optionally use GitHub Action DCI-Lint. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. it. That's all I had. Mama? Yeah, uh, there's not a uh, best practices comment as such. It's just an, uh, it's a comment about uh, what we found when we were merging Weaver into Cacti. Uh, we have some uh, code samples uh, or rather some dependencies with Corda, which is outside the Hyperledger ecosystem. And uh, uh, Corda has uh, a lot of these words that we are trying to transition to new words. And uh, we have no option but to retain them. So uh, just uh, a comment that at least until as long as those dependencies lie across Appalachia, then we'll have to sort of create exceptions. I've talked to Peter about this, by the way. He had the the DCI lint uh, action was already configured in Cacti, and uh, we are going to kind of carve out some exceptions, very nar narrowly targeted exceptions for those, those paths. So just, just a comment. Uh, other projects might face the same situation. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, let's go to the next one. This one is a little bit different category because um, this is the project incubation extra criteria, but there are a few things that are in this one that I thought would be um, good for new maintainers, especially if they're trying to uh, exit incubation uh, to be aware of. Um, and then the other note I wanted to mention was as we finish up this task force that does the first pass of all these things, we might want to take another look at the exit criteria and figure out, is that still the best list or are some of these new best practices, things that we want to recommend uh, for the project incubation exit criteria. But that can wait. And so maybe we'll circle back to this one uh, more towards the end of this task force, you know, in a couple months. All right, so that's the end of the existing content. Um, from this one down, there everything is new content. Uh, some of them we have task forces that we're going to be spinning up, like the security task forces and the documentation task forces. Um, but each of the remaining ones here are new that I thought we'd spend a few minutes discussing to see if there's agreement on what I've written here as in terms of a best practice, or if there's other um, insights or, or bullets you, the team wants to contribute here. Uh, so for project governance, we really don't haven't said much, I don't think, at the TOC level or Hyperledger level in terms of what we recommend projects do. Um, there has been a few projects that have implemented RFC processes, which I think have, have been very uh, valuable. If, I'm, if, my, if my history is correct, I think Sawtooth was the first one, and Ursa and Grid adopted the Sawtooth RFC process. Um, which is which 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 initially began from the Rust RFC process. I think that's where Sawtooth got it. Uh, then Fabric uh, latched onto that. Uh, we like the Sawtooth model. We've ex evolved it and extended it a little bit. Uh, and so I think these are all good examples of RFC processes to help with decision making uh, among project maintainers uh, around major you know, like decisions, features, design, and so on. And I think it really helps to have something in writing kind of helping to move that process along rather than just conversations. So I'll open up the floor for other comments about project governance, best practices. Rama? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, are we supposed to spin off the RFCs into a separate repository? Uh, yes, I think that's worked well um, for Sawtooth and for us in Fabric. Okay, keep that in mind, thanks. David? Um, should we be including in this um, community license specification, uh, or sorry, community specification license? Um, uh, for those not aware, that is the specification version of an open source license. And so maybe part of the best practices is these RFC repos should, in, should be operated under the community license. So that's one. And um, a second comment is 
Um, I don't know if these are being published anywhere, but it would be, I know the Aries RFC, it's really hard for a newcomer to come in and find relevant information. And so we've long had a desire to publish the information using a, you know, make docs or something um, to make it much friendlier for um, onboarding people. So anyway, I don't know if anyone has done any publishing of the RFCs and provided a way to to navigate them in a in a useful way. So just throw those two things out there as things that we found would be helpful. Uh, for the second one and fabric, we have uh, enabled GitHub pages for the RFCs repository, okay. so, which is a little bit more navigatable uh, than just the GitHub repo itself. I don't know if that's what you meant or if that, that would help. That's the type of thing I mean, yeah, exactly. It'd be good to see that because we're not doing it yet in Aries RFC, but man, I would love to. And, and I'm just trying to figure out what's the fastest way to do it. What's the easiest way to do it? And I, I didn't capture all of the first points. Um, um, so open uh, community specification license is a um, open source license. So a vetted license for um, to for undertaking specification work. And, and basically all of these RFCs are essentially specification work. And so just like there's a you know an Apache 2.0 open source code license, this is for this is a license for developing specifications. And we uh, we came across this in doing it on creds. I don't know if we're entirely using it correctly, but I think it would be a good help to put these under a under that kind of license. And again, it's it's for IP protection basically. Um, and so we, that would be a license that we put into the, each of the RFC repositories. Yeah, it's, 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 it's the license under which you're operating so that your, your specification is using community specification license version 1.0 and any open source code that happens to be in the repo is, you know, Apache two or whatever, whatever you're using. Um, I can, I'll find a link to the, to the repository. Yeah, we can put the link in here, then we can look at that. All right, so I guess I'm next uh, in the queue. So I think as far as project governance, I think the RFC process is good. I'm wondering if there's other sorts of governance that we should make sure we list under project governance. Um, I think there's a couple that we've already talked about in the like meet in the guidelines that are provided. So I'm thinking about like, how, how do you become a maintainer? What's the what's the decision making for becoming a maintainer versus becoming uh, an emeritus maintainer? Um, there's probably things that are around what do you do when there's inactivity in either a repository or or that sort of thing. And so I'm just trying to think about you know what other sort of project governance might exist that we should be in, in, ensuring that we're including in the in the list here. Um, Tracy, do you mind if I jump in here? Yeah, go for it. Um, so I'll just say on the last point, uh, on Stephen's point, uh, the LF now does recommend that you use the, the well, the legal team does recommend that you use the separate uh, community specification license for uh, standards and specification work. Uh, so I actually had a question. I asked them about this because it wasn't clear to me. Uh, you know, obviously, there's some differences between standards and specifications, but I was told that for everything in that area, that's the proper license. Um, so I just want to, you know, uh, reiterate Stephen's point and say that, you know, if you are putting out a specification, this is what you should be using. So Tracy, I want to follow up on that. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Arno. Can I jump in? Yes, so of I, I think I, I think this is you know uh, what Stephen said is a bit different from what you're saying, Hart. And I actually it never occurred to me, but I think Stephen's point is a very good one. And, and just so people understand, and you know, <laughs> big disclaimer: as you know, I'm not a lawyer. I don't even play one on TV. But but bear with me. You know, with that in mind, the the big difference, right, is 
An open source license is basically, it covers copyrights, especially the Apache 2 license, right? It, 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 it covers the copyrights and, and intellectual property somebody might have in the code they contribute to the project so that they cannot come later on and say, hey, you're infringing on my patent, now you have to pay some license fees to use it. And the difference when you work on the specification is you're just describing what the code essentially would do. And so there's a difference because there may be different ways of implementing it and so on. So the commitment is with regard to, you know, the, 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 the requirements basically specified in the specification as opposed to a specific piece of code. That's why we need in general for specification and standards, a different type of license. So that's the background. So now what I never occurred to me is what Stephen is, I think has touched on is in fact, when you think about it, RFCs in a way describe what the code is going to do. And it's similar to what a specification does. And it makes sense in that regard to say, well, given that it's similar to specification work, we should have a similar legal framework to, to kind of you know, cover this work so that when people contribute to the RFC saying, oh, we should have a feature that does this and that do this, and you know, it can go into fairly high, you know, pretty detailed stuff, the, 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 any kind of IP related issue has been covered already. So there is no issue down the line when it gets implemented. So is this something we need to just mention once in the, in the repository or mention per RFC? So it's at the repository level, but it wouldn't require a change for the repository if it's not using it now. And so all the people who have contributed to it should agree to this. It's not so easy to do afterwards, but you can do it from the get-go and say, from then on, that's what we are using. But it's at the repository level. Okay, does anybody want to volunteer to provide the exact recommendation to the projects around this? Uh, can I jump in and say that if we want an exact recommendation, we can definitely ask the LF legal. Yeah, I was going to suggest something like this, so I'm glad Hart volunteered. So I can ask LF legal about this if you all want, um, uh, because I don't want us to like, this is definitely something you want to ask a lawyer about, right? We can conjecture all we want, but if the lawyer says something else, then that's <laughs> that's the way it goes, right? Okay, I've captured that. Thanks, Hart. Absolutely. All right, so um, maybe an additional add to the project governance is to document roles and responsibilities of um, the people that are involved in the project. Uh, I think that we don't necessarily do a good job of understanding who's playing what role and what sort of responsibilities they have. Um, you know, things that we might think about, obviously maintainers, but release managers, uh, any other sorts of um, roles that might exist within the, the project itself. Um, I, I think there's probably some other things that are, are based on just like, how does the project run? Um, you know, and maybe that falls into the, the contributing part of the documentation or, um, you know, somewhere else. But I, I just, I feel like there's a, enough that is potentially interesting to newcomers to the project to understand, like, how you would participate in this community that, that probably needs to be documented as well. And Tracy, is this something you're saying we should leave up to the projects or is there some kind of template you think that we should provide as a starting point? Um, so I, I think in a lot of cases, the projects are already doing it, right? It's just not documented. Um, and I'm you know, perfectly fine to say that the, it's probably in the hands of the projects to decide like when they meet and what they, how they run their project. Um, we may want to provide some guidelines around that for new projects 
right? People who, like you said, right, when you started, you didn't necessarily have these thoughts in mind um, to, to maybe give them some, some good starting point and then they can evolve as uh, the project grows. Okay, makes sense, yeah. Hart? Yeah, um, thanks. So I think this is really good. I would say for some extra roles, I would say there's in responsibilities. Uh, I would say road mapping is a big thing here. Um, sorry, can you all hear me? Yes. Better now, yeah. Awesome, yeah, no, I had messed up my microphone. Um, yeah, so I would say road mapping is really important here. One thing we get a lot of questions about is how do I, uh, how do I affect the roadmap? Like if I want to see in something done in some project, what's the um, what's the way to do that, right? Um, and, you know, as to Dave's suggestion, you know, I think like a template is good. Uh, I generally like the approach of providing projects a template and saying like, this is sort of a default thing to do. You know, if you're an expert and you have a good reason not to do it, then then great. Uh, but otherwise, you know, this is this is a good way to start. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. Our, I think, you know, our inactivity, our maintainer inactivity policy at the top says, like, if the project has one documented already and it's working well, like this is, um, you can continue to use that. But if not, this is the one that we use by default for the, the all of the Hyperledger projects that don't have one. Um, and then I think, you know, as far as other, there, there was one other thing that popped into my mind around what happens when people go away, right? Um, should there be some sort of process for like announcing that you're, you're stepping away and, um, and, and that sort of thing? Because I, I think in general, for some of the projects that have gone dormant and then end of life, it's been because the maintainers have stepped away and maybe people didn't realize that that was happening. Um, and, and so I feel like there's some sort of best practice around just being open with, you, you know, the, the amount of time that people are willing or able to spend on a, a project. And if that time is going away, then letting people know that, you know, they need to step away for whatever reason it might be, right? And they don't have to tell us the reason, right? Um, but th just that, you know, I need to step away for, for the time being and, either I plan on coming back or I don't plan on coming back. And, and then people can make some decisions around, okay, how do we get a replacement for this person? Or um, what's the kind of next steps that need to happen? Okay, so each of those are kind of larger things. If we wanted to produce some kind of template or a starting point for projects to utilize or a fallback if they don't provide one, um, maybe maybe that is a task force in itself. What do you think? It probably is, Dave. I, I mean, I don't know if it'll take a long time to do those things, but uh, yeah, very well, maybe a new task force. Do, does any project already have this sort of information? Um, anybody aware of this that we could like take a look at and maybe use as a default template that maybe then it wouldn't require a task force? The best thing I've seen is this one around sawtooth governance. It actually went into like team structure, decision-making procedures and things like that. So it was kind of an addendum to their RFC. Uh, so that would be at least a starting point, I think. We have something similar in an on-prez. Sorry about that, I'm making coffee. We have something similar in an on -prez as well. Um, the an on -prez spec was based under community license and has a governance document about what the editors are allowed to do and and so on so um, i'll take a look as well at the saw too i don't want to volunteer for everything well at least put the uh volunteer to put the link to that yeah, in here 
These are, these are the things that I have been working on. So, you know, I do have a fair amount of experience, so I should be stepping up on these ones. So all good. Okay, with 13 minutes left, do we want to start the community section? This one might take a little longer. I guess we'll start, see how far we get. Okay, I thought we'd open with kind of, it's obvious to all of us, but maybe not to everybody else, but first and foremost, foster a welcoming, positive, and public environment where contributions are encouraged. Is that a good opening line? Yeah, I think it is, Dave. And I think, uh, wasn't there a recording that was done by somebody in, is it Sam Cohen that did a recording um, that was basically how you how you do some of this? Um, Rai, do you remember? I was going to ask Daniela, but it looks like she dropped, so. I don't remember. Um, I'm sure I can search through YouTube and see. So there's a presentation kind of about this topic, Tracy, that's what you're saying? Yeah, yep, that's what I'm saying. So we'll see if we can find it. Okay, and then for kind of the specific aspects, um, I called each one out and I thought we'd put a bullet around each one with a short, some short guidance. So for mailing lists, um, one thing that I was thinking about, we have uh, one mailing list for fabric and there's, it's a combination of, um, well, it's mostly targeted for users or most, mostly used by users. And I think one of the reasons why there's not much contributor and maintainer discussion in there is because it is kind of, uh, you, you get kind of overwhelmed with the user um, discussions. So what I thought we might wanna do for Fabric itself and maybe as a recommendation is to have one mailing list for users and another mailing list for contributor slash maintainer discussion. Does that make sense? Do you need a separate uh -huh. mailing list for contributors and maintainers? Can, if people have any issues or they want to propose something, can they not open GitHub issues and can have conversation there? They can. I, I guess the, that's the broader topic is where should, where should primarily the, these discussions take place? Mailing list or Discord? There's also GitHub discussions. And like you said, GitHub issues. Um, I think yeah, each seems like project kind of gravitates to one place. Right. I mean, it just seems to me if you have a mailing list for all contributor maintain discussions, it amalgamates a lot of different issues into one mailing list and people can switch off. So. Um, yeah, so I would say I think ultimately the communication tool is up to the project. Um, you know, whatever people want to use is fine as long as it's widely communicated um, and I would say you know on the issue of mailing lists I don't know is, is there a compelling reason why you'd want to separate like a maintainer contributor mailing list from everyone uh, you know I would assume you'd want to have as few mailing lists as possible unless you you know absolutely needed more well it, yeah so it, when the fabric mailing list was really chatty with all the um, users, it would have been nice to have a separate one. Um, but now the mailing list isn't used as, as much. And so I think we can get by on one for now. I mean, could you categorize it maybe as, as more like, a, um, I guess as like a technical or a non-technical list or like a, an application or a, or a code list? Um, yeah, I mean, I this I didn't have a whole lot of conviction around this one, so I'm fine to, to drop this idea and just say a single mailing list is a good starting point. No, I totally get it if you're like overwhelmed with with mail, um, but I think that's a like cross the bridge when you get to it. I, I think hard one of the reasons to have a separate uh, user list is. Uh, users can have uh, can face problems that other users have encountered and solved so users can fix other users problems and maintainers don't have to be involved but if it's a maintainer 
issue that's being thrashed out, then maintainers have to focus their attention on, on, on that. So separation might be a good thing. Uh, I, I think it would be good if there's a lot of traffic, but I just I just don't know that we have any lists um, where there is enough traffic. And as, a, as an aside point, that's one of the actually really good reasons why we find people using Discord uh, is that it's much easier to like look back in chat and see if people have had the same question as you rather than having to like search through the mailing list. OK, so you, you, that's a good segue into the, the chat. So I've mentioned here, it's, we need to, you need to strike a balance between too few and too many chat channels. That kind of is what you're talking about, Hart. Um, do we want to further um, tune this? Uh, so I will comment that when we did the chat task force a couple of years back, there was uh, recommendations on the sorts of channels that you should have uh, inside of Discord uh, by default or, or at the start of a project. Um, and then I think people have added to that as they've seen fit um, based on their project. So maybe we can point to that particular task force. Okay. Any other comments on mailing lists, Discord? Okay, um, public meetings. The only thing I highlighted was should occur on a regular cadence. I'm sure there's probably some other suggestions here though. Yeah, can I jump in here again, Dave? Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things that would be would be nice is if uh, projects had meetings that at least some, you know, that that uh, rotated time a little bit so that people around the world could join. Um, we get a lot of, you know, there are some projects where you know they have a fixed meeting time and never changes, and we have people in certain regions of the world and our, you know at least when I talk to people, if, if you know, they want to get more involved in the community, I frequently tell them that it's a good idea to join, you know, join the discord, join the chat and join the project meetings. Uh, and this is sort of a hard sell if the project meeting is at like 2 a.m. their time. Um, and this this is the case for, you know, a number of different projects, right? Um, so uh, I like to incur, you know, obviously for small projects, this this may not be necessary, uh, but for for big projects, I like to encourage them to have multiple meeting times so that people can attend no matter where they are in the world. Uh, and I, I think this, you know, uh, for some projects, you don't you don't know what you're missing until you try this. And I, I have seen some projects do like a Western Hemisphere and Eastern Hemisphere meeting. Do you think that works or would you think the rotating meeting times would be better? Uh, up to the project. Um, you know, I think it all it all depends on the maintainer structure. Okay, so we'll leave it like this. Consider two meetings to cover different regions or rotating meeting times. Like if you have a, a heavy US-based maintainership, right? You might want to do two meetings where the U, all the, your US maintainers can attend both of them. But if you have like a truly global maintainership, then you might want to rotate between like, you know, US, Europe, Europe, Asia, and Asia, US or something like that. We've seen a, both work. In a previous life, uh, we rotated our meetings by eight hours a week. And that meant that the people in the US had one meeting that was at a, in the middle of the morning. Um, but certainly, if you rotate it by eight hours uh, or 12 hours, uh, you could cover most of the world fairly easily. Yeah, and I'll say that the eight hour rotation ones, the general expectation was that you make two out of the three meetings. You weren't expected to make all three. Okay, makes sense, yeah.
Okay, um, we'll go on to meetups and workshops. So Jim uh, reminded me that to put these in here. Sorry, Dave, I, I would like to just go back one one step just to say something that just occurred to me is I, I think maybe a best practice should be for projects to at least provide a way for people who are, you know, who cannot join calls they would be interested in to express that desire. Because, you know, I think the problem is we kind of assume, well, you know, they, they don't participate, they don't care when in fact they may not participate because there is, they have no way to because of the time. And if at least we provided people a way to express that, I think would be a step forward. And it doesn't take much, right? It would be like, you know, on the, on the information that gets published by the project, when they say, hey, we are meeting, you know, regularly on this time and I have some notes saying, by the way, if this time is not convenient for you and you would really like to participate, please let us know, you know, whichever way. At least people would look into it and feel like, oh, okay, maybe I can try. <laughs> and makes and sense. the project um, wouldn't necessarily have to go out of their way, not knowing whether anybody will care if, if they change the time. Okay, so I wrote survey community about mess meeting time, consider two meetings or rotating meetings. Does that sound good or no? No, that's not what exactly what I mean, because I'm not saying, you know, a survey implies like at one point in time, you do a survey, you say, hey, anybody interested? I, what I'm saying is just, you know, generally speaking, along with the information about when the meetings are held, people should have some kind of information on how to express that this time is inconvenient for them. And I, you know, maybe it's the group says, sorry, that's just the way it is. But I think it would be, you know, kind of giving an olive branch, so to speak, to people saying, okay, we have not considered it other times, but if you do, then maybe you have a survey. If there are enough people who express interest to have it at a different time. You see what I mean? Okay, I see what you mean, but I don't know how to best say that. I, so I've yeah. changed survey to ask community about best meeting time, but if you've got a better wording here, All let right. me know. Or feel free to edit the wiki afterwards. Yeah, I think that's what I'll try to do, see if I can formulate what I mean. Okay. All right, we are out of time. So that's about as far as I thought we would get. Um, I think we'll need another one or two of these. Uh, probably two of these at least to get through the rest of the list as the first pass. Uh, so Tracy, I don't know, It's do we want to do this next week or do you want to just keep rotating between the different task forces? Uh, so I think we'll rotate to the different task forces. I think security is up next unless for some reason um, the other task forces aren't ready to provide updates or, or have discussions, um, in which case we'll come back to you quicker. Okay, and we can also have uh, the separate uh, off channel meeting to talk yep. about this as well. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Dave, for taking us through that. I think it's looking good so far. And we will talk to everybody again next week. Okay. Thank you.